uh, a really warm welcome to uh, Selston Baptist Church. And uh, whether you come here often, whether this is uh, your first time with us, uh, it's wonderful uh, to see you here uh, this morning. My name's Trevor, uh, and I'm the, uh, the minister here. We have a slightly different uh, kind of service this morning. Uh, it's an all-age service, so we will be together as one family, uh, young and old, for the entirety uh, of our time together. We're also going to be gathering around uh, the table uh, and sharing communion together. Uh, and so if you're uh, watching at home uh, on uh, our online service, uh, we'd invite you to perhaps now to uh, go and prepare some bread uh, and a suitable drink if you want to join us for that part of the service. Just a reminder as well, for those who are uh, part of our church family, we have our church members meeting tomorrow night here when we'll be reflecting uh, on uh, the business of our church, what we feel God is calling to us to at the moment, and a particularly important meeting as we think about our church covenant. And a reminder as well, we will be back here this afternoon at four o'clock uh, for our four o'clock service, which Don uh, is going to be leading both of our services today, reflecting on habits of generosity, habits linked uh, to one of the values in our mission statement, uh, which you will have seen if you came into the church building this morning. So lots to reflect on today. And uh, isn't it good to gather and bring our worship to our great God? Hilary is going to come and lead us into that time of worship now. Thanks, Hilary. Thank you. And uh, welcome everyone. We're going to do a, a response, and this is a welcome response for everybody this morning. And for each little phrase, there's going to be an action. And before you say, oh, I don't want to do an action, it's okay, you don't have to, you can do it inside. So if we look at the first part of our um, verse today, and we're going to be reading it, so I will start with the words at the beginning, however you've traveled here today, so it will be a question at the beginning, and you can join in with the action. So it might be that you've driven or you've run or you've walked. <laughs> and Jesus says, if you can say at the end, Jesus says, come in. And then just you can bring your arm forward. So there's a question, a statement, an action if you want to do one or not. And if you could say the bottom line with the action, Jesus says, come in okay so we're all doing that last line together with the action okay so we're going to start it and there's going to be several of these to read okay however you've traveled here today jesus says come in however you're feeling here today jesus says come in if you feel like making a noise well, Jesus says, come in. If you feel like being quiet, shh. Jesus says, come in. If you're celebrating something great, hey! Jesus says, come in. If you've made some mistakes, whoops. Jesus says, come in. If you want to meet with Jesus, Jesus says, come in. He longs to restore, renew and rebuild us. Jesus says, come in. Now, as we continue with our first song, we're going to stand and join in with our welcoming of each other and our worship. Oh, hey. 
you'd like to sit down. <laughs> now, um, I'd like to introduce you to a <laughs> song that uh, you won't know, and we're going to be singing, so we're going to learn a little bit of it and um, learn it this morning. So, it's called As the Sun Rises, so we're going to learn the chorus first. Okay. So we'll sing it through with you, um, just the chorus, and then could you sing it the second time round? As the sun rises on a new day, may our hearts say God is good to us. As the sun rises on a new day, may our souls say you are faithful. If you want to grab an instrument or anything, there are a few on the side. If you want to grab one and, and add a little bit of uh, percussion, that would be lovely. Otherwise, we're going to stand and sing this as our second worship song.
seat and well done for tackling a, a new all-age song. Um, now those two songs we've sang are all about being generous. Who's feeling really, really generous and kind this morning? No one. Oh, <laughs> maybe if I go and get something that looks very interesting, you might feel more generous and kind if you know what's in my bag. So, I'm looking for some help this morning. So, if you'd like to come and be generous and come and help me. I don't mind whether you're a, a little one, a big one, okay, or in between it doesn't matter. Oh, well done, Erica. Brilliant, okay. Would you like to grab one of these bags? Anyone else? Well done, Amaya. You want to grab a bag? Brilliant, love your smile this morning. Well done. Come stand here. Okay, anyone else? Brilliant. Oh, lovely, Erica. There we go. Okay, hold on to those. Are you feeling generous this morning? Are you feeling very generous and kind and able to share? Because that's what the, we talk about with God, don't we? Because God's generosity is always there. It's never ending. If we had a great big ball of string and we kept on raveling, that's a bit like God's love for all of us. He loves us so much it never stops. The string never runs out. It's a bit like a big explosion of generosity. So I wonder if we can test you on your... You think you're really good at sharing and being... Kind? Okay, so if you look in your bag, could you go and give, put your hand inside your bag, each one of you, and pull something out and just go and give it to someone in the church that you can see? How quickly can you do? Go and, pull some, go and share something with someone in the church. Ready? Steady? Go. Okay, do come back. Well done. Okay, thank you. So that's a good sign of gen generosity, isn't it? Sharing something. She's not sure. Put your hand up if you'd like something shared with you. Then she can give it to you. Thank you very much. Now, come back. Look in your bag. What's the biggest thing you've got in there? What's the biggest thing you've got in there? Pull it out. Okay. Do you think you could put that in somebody else's bag now? Whose bag could you put that in? Could you put that in Erica's or a my? Could you put one of yours in the mice? Could you share with each other and be generous? Okay, you're going to put that in the mice. Brilliant. You put it in there. Could you share something of yours with someone? No, That's okay. She's being very generous. Don't say no. That's lovely. <laughs> oh, you're doing really well with your generosity today. I wonder, could you share something with me then? Look, I've got a really big bag. Could you take something out and share something with me? Oh, that's really kind of you. They're good at sharing, aren't they, and being generous. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, wow. Lovely. Brilliant. 
So how did you feel, I wonder? I don't know whether we... Are we on this morning? How did you feel giving something to someone else? Happy. Did it make you happy? Yeah. Ah. How did you feel? Happy. Did, did you not feel a bit sad that you didn't have left in your bag one of those things and you no. gave it? Oh, that's good. That's a very generous heart, isn't it? Did you like being generous and kind? <laughs> not too sure. Okay. Now, but being kind and being generous isn't just about food, is it? Do you, can you think of any other ways we can be kind and generous? Can you? By making someone be happy. Yes, by cheering somebody up. That's really good. God loves it, doesn't he? When we are cheering people up and looking after people. And sometimes we can share kind words, can't we? We can do actions. And we can send someone a message or maybe even bake them a cake or take a meal along to somebody. That's being kind and being generous and scattering God's generosity around. Now, we talked a little bit about generosity, and we have something for everyone to do. So you can take those back with you, and you can either share them or you can take them home. So we want to go back with your back to where you were sitting. Lovely, well done. Thank you. Yeah, give, do give them a cut. Well done. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it, giving away things that you really want to have for yourself. I thought they did really well this morning. Now, we want to be thankful, and if we are thankful um, and have a thankful heart and a very generous heart, it's not because we think we should, is it? It's because God loves us so very, very much. So we've got a thankful chant to do this morning. So if we can have a, a look at it on our screen, and it's called Everybody Praise the Lord. So I'd like us to get really, really thankful and in a praise mood. Let's thank God for his generosity this morning. So we're going to do it as a kind of a wrap. So I'm going to need, I did have last Sunday, someone who's now not here, <laughs> um, who was going to help me with this. Okay. So I need a good, steady, strong beat. Who's good at making a good, steady, strong beat? Somebody that could do that and consistently. Any volunteers? Do you want to come? Yeah? Anyone? Oh, Paul. Right. Could you give us a good, steady, strong beat? Lovely. Okay. Now, as we start this rap, okay, we're going to be saying it to a rhythm. So, um, should we just practice the first few lines? If you give us a good... Keep going. Just keep it going. Keep it going. So we go. Praise him in his sacred space. Everybody praise the Lord. Praise him in his heavenly place. Everybody praise. Got it. You've got it. Anyone like to help me with this? Yeah? Lovely. If you've got an instrument or you can spy one... Join in. That's great. So we'll keep it going. Now, there may be some things you need to do if you want to. So some of the verses have an action. Some of them have something we can do. So, and so tambourines, let's all stand up. So whatever you feel you want to do this morning as we're praising God. Okay. So shall we start with our four beats? One, two, three, four. Praise him in his sacred... Everybody praise the Lord. Praise him in his heavenly place. Everybody praise the Lord. Praise him for his hand is strong. Everybody praise the Lord. His greatness just goes on and on. Everybody praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everybody praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody praise the Lord. Tambourines just keep the beat, everybody praise the Lord. Let's all stand up on our feet, everybody praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody praise the Lord. 
well done, thank you. Fabulous, Paul, brilliant. Okay, thanks for joining in. So, um, Trevor's going to be coming to talk to us a little bit about Psalm 112. There are a few activities um, outside the back if um, anyone feels they need to have a stretch, but don't all go out, otherwise <laughs> Trevor might be left to speak to no one. Okay, and, um, and then I think the service will follow on from that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hilary. That was, uh, that was fantastic. So yeah, those activities uh, are out the back. Uh, if uh, you or uh, some of the little ones uh, want to do those. But for now, uh, we're going to reflect on Psalm 112. And uh, Sheila is going to come and bring that reading to us. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. His children will be mighty in the land. Each generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, Light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. Goodwill come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadiest, is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked man will see and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Amen. Thanks so much, Sheila. And uh, as I was saying, I, I don't want to talk for too long about this passage, but um, in the time that I speak... I just want us to reflect on uh, a really big question that I think this psalm raises for all of us and the answer it provides, which I think turns out to be a bit more surprising than you might imagine. And the question is just this. What does a truly blessed person look like? What does a truly blessed person look like? Do you have in your mind's eye a, a vision of the sort of person who God is favoring? And now in my experience, uh, the, the answer to that question may well depend on the sort of church you go to, on the sort of theology you have. I know some churches where the definition of blessedness is it's actually about what you have uh, or how you look or... Uh, even how well you are health-wise. And so you're left with this impression that uh, the only people who are really knowing God's favor are the ones that are winning at life, you know, to use that expression that we might be familiar with. But the thing is, this isn't the answer Psalm 112 provides for this question. Instead, the psalm gives uh, or begins with these words. It says... Praise the Lord, and blessed are those who fear the Lord and who find great delight in his commands. So in other words, the person uh, who will be truly blessed is the one who trusts God and who looks to God and who, who lives in a way uh, that is faithful to him and to his commands. 
But then the thing is, the more you think about that answer, the more that you find it raises more questions. You've got to peel away a little bit more what is going on because to me, I find myself thinking about, well, what does this word blessed even mean? And what do we actually mean by finding delight in God's commands? Now, we read, or Sheila read uh, for us uh, from the NIV. But it's interesting that if you look at various different versions of this psalm and you look at it in different translations, you'll find that there's a a different word that often comes at the start of the the, the psalm. So the NIV says, uh, blessed are those who fear the Lord. Uh, That's the word that we find in the message as well. If you look at the New Living Translation, it it says how joyful uh, are those who fear the Lord. Uh, The New Revised Standard Version, when I looked that up, it says happy are those who fear the Lord. And the thing is, you you kind of find that different um, spread of words because the the word that's um, being translated from Hebrew is, it's actually really hard to pin down. The thing is, when we talk about blessed these days, I mean, I wonder if we think of it as being, like it's a nice word, and it's a spiritual word, but maybe it's quite a small word. Oh, God bless you, you know, I hope you're okay. Uh, I hope you feel blessed, I hope you feel good, I hope you have uh, a nice day or whatever. But actually, the word blessed, the way that the the Jewish people who would have first uh, sung this psalm or, or spoken this psalm, for them, this word is, it's a massive word. Uh, it's huge. Uh, this word blessed conveys the idea, <clears throat> if I can put it like this, of, of a life where everything fits together and it's just right. It's like a life of wholeness and a life of uh, contentedness. And what's particularly striking is the psalmist says, you you get to that place of blessedness or contentedness or almost feeling just so, I'm okay, I'm anchored, I'm on solid ground. You get to that place by delighting in God's commands. But then when it says, this is what it looks like to delight in God's commands, they they, they were given a, a very specific example of what it really looks like to delight in his commands. And when we read about that, what we discover is that there's something about a life of obedience, which seems to be very kind of intimately connected, kind of bound up, if you want to put it that way, with generosity. And listen to what the psalmist says, verses four and five. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. And for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. And good will come to those who are generous and lend freely and who conduct their affairs with justice. And it's worth thinking for those verses. Take them home, chew them over, reflect on them for a bit. I mean, it's interesting because those verses are not actually saying, they're not a kind of every little thing will be all right promise. They acknowledge that even for people who follow God, some difficult things might happen, even in darkness. Even in darkness, there may be difficult moments, but light will dawn from your you. Even in those moments, you won't be totally cut off from his light. But then you have these references, do you notice them, to compassion, to being gracious and being generous. And I looked at that and I guess I thought, well, It's interesting, isn't it? We all face moments of darkness in our lives. But do you ever notice how some people respond in different ways? So there are some people I know, and perhaps when things get difficult, when resources get scarce, it's almost like they think, well, I've got to become a bit more grasping. I've got to hold on more tightly to what I've got, because I need it. Things might run out. But then have you noticed that there are, of some people, and even when things are hard, even when things are difficult, they're somehow still able to be generous, somehow still able to share what they have. And the psalmist says, you've got a picture there of what a blessed life looks like, of what a good life looks like. 
And then there's another thing that I find striking about this passage, and it's the way that these people are described as being gracious and compassionate and righteous. And the thing is, when you you look at that a little bit more closely, and when you look at other verses in the Old Testament, you find that that description of blessed people and people who are following God, it's actually really similar to how the Old Testament describes God himself. There is, uh, back in the book of Exodus, a description of God, which for the Jewish people was almost conceived of as being like the classic, the definitive definition of what God is like. And as part of that description of him, we read this description of the Lord. He saw that he's the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Do you see those words? Do you see the connection, compassionate and gracious? This is what God's like. And this is what the people who spend enough time with him and enough time following him might come to look like. I guess it's not a surprise. We talk sometimes, don't we, about, you know how you see married couples or people who've lived together and been close to each other for years and they know each other so well, they, they just, they've come to think like each other. They finish each other's sentences and they fill in details in each other's stories because they've been in the same place, they've inhabited the same place. It's almost as if the psalmist says, I think, the people who spend time with God come to show God's character to the rest of the world as they look on. And people who get to know God get a sense of how generous he is and that enables them to be generous as well. And it's hard, but I think people who fail to see how generous God is, maybe particularly people who fail to see just how forgiving he is and how merciful he is, they might sometimes end up being the ones who just hold on a little bit more to what they have. Jesus told a story about that. And uh, if you come to the four o'clock service this afternoon, you'll hear a little bit more about it. Dawn's going to be reflecting on that. All fits. It's all of a piece. Time's almost gone, but uh, can I leave you with a story for now? And uh, it's a story which, uh, something that happened to us, and um, it's a story that I just couldn't help thinking about when I've been thinking about this passage in last week and uh, the theme of generosity. And I think what this looks like in, in practice And it's all to do with uh, the time years ago when we went off, 17 years ago, my goodness, uh, when uh, we kind of quit our jobs and I went off to train uh, to be uh, a Baptist minister. We all went off and and lived uh, in a different place. And um, it was a time of change, time of really significant change for us. Uh, we, we'd both given up our jobs where we lived uh, in Exeter, and uh, we'd gone off to another church uh, in uh, the Midlands where I was going to be based. I'd be there working during the week, and I'd commute down to Bristol Baptist College. And it was a time of transition, uh, a time of, frankly, tightening our belts because there was a lot less income uh, to work with. But there were certain ways in which actually we hadn't made our sums add up because uh, one of the things that we hadn't worked out how we'd pay for were my fees to train to be a Baptist minister. So the Baptist Union doesn't have lots of money and if ever you uh, or anyone else trains to be part of uh, or trains to be a minister for the Baptist Union, you have to pay for that training yourself. And uh, it's a lot of money. And to be honest, we didn't have the money to cover the fees. Uh, We went off to college. We knew that we had a gift uh, of about a thousand pounds from our church in Exeter, a thousand pounds from one other person, but the fees were six thousand pounds a year. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Uh, It's a lot of money now, and it was a lot of money in 2006. It was even more. And I can still remember one afternoon the college business manager called me into his office. And as I went into his office, I was thinking to myself, we're going to have the fees conversation now. And 
I don't know how this is going to go. But we'd settled up for the first term because we had this first installment. And he said that he'd had a letter from some of our friends in Exeter. And what he said was, these are people who know you well. They're from your sending church in Exeter. And uh, they don't want you to know who they are. They don't want their name to be revealed to you, but they're grateful to you. They valued things that you did in the church in Exeter. And they think that it's good that you're going on and doing this. And they love you and care for you. And so all of your fees for the first year at college have been settled. Wow. Now, here's the thing. I trained for four years at Bristol Baptist College. Second year, start of the year, I'm called into the business manager's office. Didn't have a penny for that year's fees. It's fine. Six thousand pounds. It's been covered. The same person has sent you the letter. Third year, same thing happens. Fourth year, the same thing happens. My goodness, how incredibly generous. It's beyond imagining. And we still don't know who that was. We still don't know who our mystery benefactor was. But I look back and I still find myself pinching myself. And the thing is, when something like that happens to you, I didn't just think, oh gosh, my, my debts are paid off. I mean, you think that as well, but you feel blessed. And more than anything, you just feel so loved. You really do. And you feel loved by people and you feel so loved by God. And time and again, during that time in college, when it was really hard studying, and actually time and again when I've done this job and it's been quite hard and I've thought, why are we doing this? I thought, God wanted you to do this. God provided for you to do this. This was meant to be so. So again, when you bless and when you give, you do far more than just provide for someone. You're communicating love. You may even be affirming uh, a call. And I suppose as well, I want to tell you that story because when I come back to that story, it's often occurred to me that that is, it's one of those examples of how sometimes blessing, I think, has a snowball effect and it goes and it gathers pace and it, it sort of kind of like gets more and more people wrapped up in what is going on. Because on one level, you could say, well, that was just an investment in us. That was just covering our debts. It was just covering our fees. But actually, actually, it was an investment in the people of God. And it enabled me to be trained. So there's a church in Birmingham that for eight years had a minister who was trained by the Baptist Union and in one of their colleges because somebody had been generous. And isn't that a thought now, Selston Baptist Church? The reason I stand before you and I've actually been trained and formed is because there's somebody in Exeter who none of you will ever even have met, for all I know, who was generous enough 17 years ago to provide. Isn't that remarkable? And it makes me think that when we are generous... When we find it in ourselves to be generous, and look, not all of us have the resources to do that, but there's something about being generous, which, to kind of pun on the word, is generating. It actually creates new life. It actually unleashes new possibilities. It can set things in motion and blessing in motion, a kind of godly chain reaction that we might not even conceive of. We might not even begin to imagine how God might work through that. And the psalmist says, praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord and who find great delight in his commands. And well, praise the Lord indeed. Because when people follow God and when people live as God intends, there's just a lot of generosity, I think, and a lot of blessing that ensues. And it's almost like you've not just got one person whose life is blessed or content or fitting together just so. 
just the way it would, whatever that word blessed means in all its fullness and richness and wonder, you've almost got like a whole economy, a whole community, a whole way of people doing things, the people of God who are living in a blessed way, who are giving and receiving in a way that reflects his goodness and his love. And hopefully we've got a sense, maybe in that story, and maybe as we reflect on this psalm, of what life might look like, and the sense of what's possible when the blessing of God arrives in our lives and we share it and uh, disperse it, as it were, into the lives of others. Should we pray? Should we um, pause and pray for a moment? Oh Lord, you are so generous, my goodness. You give and you give and you give. Uh, in the book of James, you tell us that you, you are the father of heavenly lights and uh, you long to give uh, without hesitation, without deviation. You don't pause. Think about what you uh, said, Jesus, when you uh, spoke about uh, the heart of the father and you said that uh, if any one of us ever uh, need a fish or a bread, you wouldn't give us a serpent or a stone. You love us and you know what we need. So thank you for things that you give to us. And thank you for how often when your generosity arrives, it's in the form of uh, generous people. So we thank you now for people who've been generous to us and have blessed us. And maybe we pause and we take a think, well, what might it look for, like for us? If we're in a position to do something today, what might that generosity uh, look like? Thank you again. We grind all of this as we pray. We grind all of this in our understanding of you and what you're like. In a moment, we're going to move to the table and we're going to think of how you've given most of all. You've given us Jesus for whom we are so thankful. So now we come, we offer you a song of praise and we prepare to gather. And all these prayers we say are in your name, Jesus. Amen. So friends, we're going to gather uh, around the table. I think Hillary is going to bring in uh, our younger children uh, and uh, we'll gather as uh, a family. Uh, as we sing this next song, uh, reflecting again on God's goodness and generosity to us, those of us who uh, regularly worship here will take up uh, our offering for God's work in this place. Thanks. Should we stand up?
God, how good you are, how generous you are. Oh, how loving. Oh, what a wideness in your mercy and what an unwavering aspect there is to your faithfulness towards us. We're so grateful. Uh, this is not a gift, it is a return in light of all you have done for us. We give as grateful people, we sing our songs as grateful people, and now we come to eat and to drink, and we do so as grateful people. Amen. Thanks. <clears throat> friends. I wonder if those who are serving could uh, join me, if that's okay, at the table. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And so, as we uh, gather at this table, just in light of all we've heard earlier, it seems appropriate for a moment just to pause and reflect on uh, words of Paul uh, that we find in 2 Corinthians 8, and he's talking about generosity and giving to the church in Corinth, and he says this, you know the generous love of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. It's expressed in so many ways, time and again, when he writes to different churches, but it's an apt description of his love this morning. Poverty to riches for us, wealth to poverty for him. What incredible love. So as we come to the table, can I invite you to listen to these words of invitation. It looks like bread, and it is bread. But God is incredibly imaginative, and there is a surprise in this bread, for within each crumb, God has folded nothing less than heaven. And when we break it, and everyone has a piece, what we are doing is saying, let's share together the story of Jesus. And it looks like a goblet of wine, and it is wine, juice. But God being God didn't leave it there and has squeezed into each drop a promise for the whole world. And so when we pass it among us and everyone has a taste, it sort of whispers to our souls entangles with memories telling us God loves us. God loves us. God loves us completely. So let's break bread and listen to the story and share wine and hear the promise. Before we do, we pause and... Uh, we just take a moment to pray and to confess. And to say sorry for things that we've said and done which we regret, uh, which we know have caused hurt and pain to others. And to say sorry for the things that we haven't said and done uh, which could have brought blessing. And for that, we say sorry also. Paul, when he writes to the church in Corinth, particularly asks the Christians there to discern the body. It's really his way of saying, think about your relationships in the room with the people with whom you break bread and drink wine and share the meal. So we take a moment as well. Who do we need to say sorry to here? Who do we need to talk to after this service for things right? And as we say these prayers and bring our regrets 
and bring our requests to God that he would forgive. We just remember the promises of Scripture that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So on the Thursday night, uh, Jesus gathered with his friends in an upper room and they shared a meal together. And then as darkness fell, Jesus broke some bread and took some wine and asked his friends to remember him every time they broke bread and drank the wine together. And because we are his disciples today, we remember that story and how the story continues in this place today. And we remember Jesus as we break this bread together and share this wine with each other. We are doing as Jesus asked us to do, and we are glad to do so. And just as Jesus said a prayer of thanks uh, for that bread and that wine, we'll say, Prayer of thanks now. Adam's going to lead us in that. Thanks, Adam. Yes, Lord, we want to thank you that we're here together as a family this morning. Lord, as we gather around the communion table, we really feel how generous you are, Lord, not just in your creation not just uh, in all the ways that you bless us and how you deem to work with us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, but your love for us and how generous you are in pouring that love out, Lord. And we just can't help but reflect on the cross, Lord, um, as you gave everything for us, more than just your physical body, but that separation uh, from the Father, Jesus. We can't really ever comprehend that, but we can be thankful in every way we can, Lord. So as we gather uh, around the communion table, Lord, we just offer you all of our praise. We offer you our lives, Lord, um, as we just sang, uh, Lord, in that last song. Um, we just can't ever really comprehend as we see you on the cross, Lord. So this morning we just give you uh, our lives, Lord. We give you um, all of our prayers and we thank you for what the bread and wine represents and for that kingdom economy, Lord, where generosity um, is at the center, Lord, and we give, Lord, and we give as you gave for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, friends, we come and uh, we eat together. This table is open wherever you're from. <laughs> If you come here often, if this is your first time with us, you're welcome. This, this, as we always say, this is not the table of Salston Baptist Church. It's the table of the Lord, and it's welcome to all uh, who love him. Uh, the bread is gluten-free uh, as well, so if that is a concern to any of you, it's okay. Uh, take and eat and taste and touch. So we share bread together. Jesus, amongst his disciples, took bread he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. This is my body, broken for you. Remember me when you do this. Thank you. And we'll eat as we receive.
And Jesus took wine also and lifted it, saying, This cup is a symbol of my covenant with you. Remember me when you drink from it. And we will hold on to the cups when we receive them. And in a moment, we will drink together as one body. Thanks. wonderful we've run out <laughs> praise god really um bear with us here uh, for a moment but friends uh, jesus took wine lifted it saying this cup is a symbol of my covenant with you remember me when you drink from it so all of us who love jesus let's drink and agree not to forget We'll pause, and uh, before our final hymn, let's pray. And having gathered around the table as a family, we pray uh, for our church family and for the needs of our world as well. 
Our loving God, uh, we come and uh, we gaze on these symbols, which are symbols of love and yet symbols of uh, brokenness and symbols of entering in, of incarnation, of uh, entering into loss, entering into sickness, entering into sorrow, entering into a world marred by sin, entering into death itself. Nothing that we bring has not been experienced first by you. We think of how we can come uh, to a high priest who understands our sorrows, and to you we bring our prayers now. Oh, loving God, uh, I pray particularly this morning for Bill Dixon's family, and uh, we grieve uh, the loss of Bill during the week. Thank you that he is uh, no longer in that pain uh, that had uh, and, and that frailty that he'd experienced for so long. Thank you that he's at home with you. But for those uh, who grieve and who mourn, we pray uh, for his family, particularly for Martin and Diane and Terry and uh, Julie, and just ask that you surround them with your love. And for others of us who are here, uh, for some of us who have experienced loss uh, in recent days, I just that uh, there would be a key alongside us and you abide with us. Hope. I pray for those of us in this place we just know how much near to Andy and others who are, are managing uh, this significant piece of work and a, a, a change which unfolds week by week before our eyes. And finally, I want to pray for our world. I pray for... Pray um, for... Um, well, Lord, we pray for creation which has groaned this week, uh, this planet in which we live and uh, climates which seem to be becoming ever more unpredictable and uh, we've turned on the news this weekend and we've heard of of um, <coughs> terrible sort of record temperatures and heat in Europe and uh, in the United States uh, but we've read also of terrible flooding and loss of life in Asia uh, we pray for South Korea uh, and people who've been terribly impacted by flooding there and in North India, we, we pray for Herbert Paul and that hospital uh, where Paul and Sue have served for so many years and a place known, uh, visited by some of us with which we've journeyed. Uh, and and very bad flooding uh, there and asked for comfort and safety. And even here in the middle of July, we've had storms blowing and strong winds uh, in Selston. And it's just a reflection of how our planet more and more just seems to cry out and speak of 
something disordered and something changing within its very being. You've called us and told us and commanded us to care for your creation. Help us to think about how we can do that. May those in places of power be empowered and emboldened to lead on the change our planet needs. Uh, Bring this change, we pray. So we love you. We trust you. Uh, We bring you these prayers in the name of Jesus, who uh, first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. For there is not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're going to sing, I think, our, uh, our final hymn, final song together. So kind of like stand if you're able. And we'll sing sweet to the sweet Jesus. We join out in a generous moment. A generous
in, I think they're red. So I'll stop. As we leave this place, go with us, Lord. As we begin a new week, as we encounter new experiences, go with us. As we meet old friends and new, in everything we do in the week ahead, Amen.